This is the third message in our series called Stress Fracture. And we've said each week this is kind of like God's pain management system for his people in this age. Uh, there's a verse that we've kind of pinned this entire series to, and I'd kind of like to start by just focusing your attention on it. It's from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. And it reads this way. Jesus said on the last night that he was with his disciples before going to the cross, he said, I've told you these things. And you can read chapter 14, 15, and 16 up to that point to know what he told them. I've told you these things so that in me you may have, and the word is, peace. In me you may have peace. In this world you will have, what? Trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. As God's people in this age, we should never be surprised when things don't go the way we want them to. We should never be surprised by trouble. I mean, Jesus could not have been more raw. He could not have been more honest. He couldn't have been more clear. There are multitudes of other scriptures that say that God's people, those that love God, those that are walking faithful to him, those that are determined to do his will, those that are unrestrained in their surrender to God, they're going to have trouble, (laughs) trouble in this world. But then Jesus said, it's okay, because in him, we can have peace. Now, in our better moments, we know that, that circumstances actually, circumstances play a large role, but they actually don't determine the interior quality of our life or our happiness. I mean, we've all seen people that have great circumstances. They appear to have it all. You know, everything that a person could want, they have, and yet they're still miserable, and they're nasty, and they're negative. How many have ever met somebody like that? You know, they, they, their circumstances are great. Okay. So in our clearer-minded moments, we know that circumstances actually do not actually determine a person's interior uh, happiness quotient. We've also likely met people that it seems like everything that could go wrong is going wrong. And they have very little, maybe next to nothing. And yet, truth be told, they appear to be content. They appear to, appear to be happy and joyful and, and grateful. And even though their circumstances are dreadful, we've met people like that. So this, this tells us that the interior quality of your life does not have to be determined by your exterior circumstances. Jesus was honest. The word of God is honest. God is not intervening in this particular age and righting all the wrongs and answering all the prayers the way his people would want them to be answered. He's not doing that. He never said that he was. He is saying that in this age, he's allowing sin and sorrow, pain and death to work their way out, but he's there in the midst of it working out something yet greater. And then he promises at the end of the age, he'll more than make up for the sufferings his people have gone through. But he said we should be expecting trouble. In fact, if we go through life and it's too easy, that should be what shocks us. Because Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. But he said, in him you can have peace. So here's this paradox. We can can go through trouble. We can go go through less than ideal circumstances for an indefinite period of time, which is one of the hardest things to go through. Less than ideal circumstances for an indefinite period of time. You don't know when it's going to end, if it's going to end. We can go through that and still have this thing that Jesus called peace. This interior tranquility, this interior sense of certainty, this interior sense of calm and and a positive uh, outlook in spite of, not because of, circumstances. Now, one of the ways that we can do this, and we see this in the Psalms in particular over and over again, is simply by choosing no matter what our circumstances are, choosing, making a decision to praise God. Um, now, if, if we were to see a commercial on TV, we see these commercials all the time for various pharmaceuticals, you know, they, they say, oh, why don't you take this, take that, and then at the end of it, it has all these disclaimers, you know, look at it, it could make you happen, this, that, and the other, you know, and by the time you hear the disclaimers, you don't want to take the product, you'd rather take your chances. But what if there were actually a product, you know, it came on TV, and it said, listen, here's this new uh, new pharmaceutical that can, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, it can instantly alter your mood. And even though things are going bad around you, inside you will, you will feel peace. Some of you are thinking, well, they already have that, but it's not legal. <laughs> um, forget that. That's, that's <laughs> but this product that advertised on TV, it's legal and it's not addictive and it, it's good for your liver and... Um, <laughs> 
and it actually doesn't plunge you into denial. You see your circumstances, you see your challenges, you see your problems even more clear than you saw them before you took this particular pharmaceutical. But this thing alters your mood. So you're going through the turbulence, you're going through the storm, but inside, man, it's, it's peace, it's calm, it's, it's collected, it's stable, it's strong. Now, you know, I won't ask you to raise your hands. You know you'd be lining up <laughs> to buy this drug. And it's cheap on top of it. I forgot to add that in. It's cheap. It's very affordable. The world would be lining up to get this drug. And what God is going to present to us through his word today in his pain management system for his people in this age is something that effective. Praising God when rightly understood, when rightly practiced, literally can alter your mood Almost instantly. Almost instantly, regardless of what you're going through. Now, I'm not saying that we should just look at it me mechanistically to use it like that, but, but praising God is just sanity. It's just clarity. It's just seeing things as they are. But this seeing things as they are, seeing the whole picture and not part of the picture, it has a way of changing the way we feel. We see it differently, we feel differently, and so no matter what we're going through, we have a balancing mechanism. And that's the power of praise. But I don't want you to get just isolated on praise as a, as a mechanistic phenomenon, something to use. I want you to see it as what's normal. It's, it's when people's eyes are open, when we're seeing life as it actually is. We will spontaneously praise. How many of you guys, um, you know, Redskin season starting, how many, how many of you guys are, are football fans? Let, let's see. How many of you just hate football? Okay, I, I'm serious. I want to say, okay. All right, now. The football fans, if your team is doing well, uh, do, do you, do you kind of get a little excited and do you tend to talk about it a little bit? How many tend to get excited and talk about it a little bit? Okay. But now you that raise your hand as you hate football, you, you could care less. If, if a great play happens or if somebody does something astounding, you don't get excited, you don't praise, you don't clap, you don't cheer, right? Probably you don't even know the rules to the game. It's, it's, it's kind of like me with hockey or soccer. I've now alienated most of you probably. Um, <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, man, it was baseball, basketball, football. That was it. All these other things are foreign. You know, they're, they're you know, things that have been brought here. But anyway, if you don't understand, it's no different than, a, than an opera. I'm just curious. Are there, I'm, I'm not going to offend you, but are there any opera fans, people that really understand and you like opera? Can I see your hand? There are a few. Now, you see, I don't understand it. It's not even in English. <laughs> Therefore, when you hear opera, you can discern the difference. You're like, oh, wow, wow, when the big lady hit that note, man, and, and the little guy hit that, you, you know, it, it was on, and I'm like, oh, man, let's go to the football game, you know, I, you see, the degree of understanding and enlightenment that we have on a subject, whether it be a sport or opera or something like that, determines our reaction and our praise for it. Praise is the result of understanding something that is. It is seeing into something. It is, it is having our eyes open. It is having our vision cleared. It's having our awareness elevated. I, I, I'll get into this more. I mean, we're, we're going to go back to it. But praise is, is extraordinarily powerful uh, and beneficial to bring that peace that Jesus spoke about when rightly understood. Why don't we turn now to a psalm. And again, the psalms are full of this. The psalmist will be complaining and yelling at God and saying, I I'm knock out the enemy's teeth and all this stuff. Next thing you know, he says, oh, and yet I praise you for your righteousness and your goodness, you know. He knew something. The psalmist knew something. Go to Psalm 103. It'll be page 428. Or page 595 uh, on those Bibles that are near, the, near you on the chair, 428 or 595. And I'm actually going to read you, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 verses, something like that. Follow with me. Praising it out, part of God's uh, methodology to bring this peace of Christ into our lives, no matter what our circumstances are. Psalm 103, beginning with verse 1. It's an exhortation. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Pause for just one minute. He's exhorting himself. Okay, we, we read this sometimes as though he's saying some kind of religious cliche. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He is telling himself, praise the Lord. Oh, my inmost being, praise the Lord. He is revving himself up. He is stirring up his consciousness to do something that he knows is appropriate. So, so don't miss that. Now, of course, he's exhorting everybody else to do it too, but he's exhorting himself first. Praise the Lord. O oh, my soul, 
and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Sometimes we, we can forget what he does for us and we take it for granted and then we don't praise him. What does he do for you? He forgives all your sins and he heals all your diseases. If you're alive today, he has healed your diseases at this point. You're still alive and breathing. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires, not all of them, but the better ones, with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Not completely now, but in the future entirely. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. They didn't know him as well as Moses did. The Lord is, now here's some traits that are praiseworthy. The Lord is compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities and we're all really glad of that for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him or for those that revere him trust in him so far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us as a father has compassion on his children so the lord has compassion on those who fear him for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And we can stop right there. It's a psalm that is exhorting this, this act, this practice of praising God. And I want to say something right from the start. Because I think there's a lot of fogginess about this issue amongst church people. Uh, God does not want us... In other words, God is not the one commanding praise because he needs it for himself, for his ego. It's not like God says, oh man, I really feel good now. You, you get, when you guys are praising me, whew, I really feel great. God wants us to praise him because he knows that it means we are seeing things as they are. It means that our sensibilities, our moral sensibilities are developing so that the finer things, the worthy things, we see them, we appreciate them, and we can partake of their, their power. So praise is frankly for us, his people. It's not like God needs it at all. It's for us. Now, praising it out, when we are going through some of the most uh, uncomfortable por portions in life, it, it's not reflexive, it's not easy, it's not natural. When you're going through grief or loss or anger or frustration or or loneliness, or, or, or sickness, or any number of the, these troubles that we all may encounter, it's, it's, it's more natural to stay riveted upon the problem, to just stay focused and riveted, because it consumes us, it troubles us, and, and it, it draws, and it creates our emotional state. The more we think about the issue, the more our emotions grow in intensity. And it is extremely unnatural in that state to stop and say, I am going to praise God. And yet to do so, as unnatural as it is, is powerful and it's always appropriate because God is who he is. He's always who he is. He's always good. He's always trustworthy. And it's just a matter of us allowing him to be a part of the equation in what all, whatever it is we're going through. L listen to the way Isaiah says it. And, and we're focusing on now to... to to refocus on God's presence and promises. When we're going through an uncomfortable inner season in life, what God wants us to do, the way he wants to comfort us, the way he wants to strengthen us, the way he wants to bring peace to us, is he wants us to take these minds and wills of ours that he's given us and to deliberately stop the pattern, that, that, that running of our emotions and our thoughts on the problem, and refocus on God's presence and on God's promises. Isaiah really helps with this. Look at what he says in Isaiah 43, chapter 1. It says, but, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, and the first thing that the Lord says is what? Fear not. And when we have troubles, when we are in pain, when we're feeling loss or lost, 
Uh, fear is usually one of the first emotions we feel. We're, we're, we feel threatened. We feel vulnerable. But, but the Lord comes and he says, listen, fear not for I have redeemed you. Now this is 700 years before Christ came and bore our sins on the cross. But God already was saying that he's going to do whatever it takes to bring back his people out of the slavery of sin. The guilt of sin, the power of sin, and someday the presence of sin. It's saying, I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. Listen, God doesn't love us in mass. God knows your name. Until, until, until you live that, until you live in the light of that. Man, he knows your name. He has watched you since you were born. He knows every incident Every disappointment, every victory, every celebration, every tear, every smile. He knows you like no one else. He calls you by name. He says, I have summoned you by name. You are mine. If you've put your faith and trust in Christ as you sit here today, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, then you are God's and he is yours. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. But have you done that? That's critical. It's not about just being religious or, or being sentimentally disposed toward God. It's, it's, it's really critical and clear. Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you said at some point in so many words, let the rest of the world do whatever it wants, follow whoever it wants, I'm going to put my trust in Christ. He created the universe. He loved me enough to come into this planet and reveal himself and die on the cross to pay for my sins. He rose from the grave proving that he has the power to truly deliver mankind from all of its ills and to actually forgive my sins and raise me from the grave. I'm going to put my faith in him. You follow whoever you want, but I'm going to follow Jesus. I trust him. Have you made that kind of a decision? That's what it means to become a Christian. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to turn from light to darkness. That's what it means to be born of the Spirit. That's what it means to be regenerated and all these various descriptions in Scripture. Have you put your faith in Christ? Are you His follower? Because if you are, then you belong to God and you belong to God for time and eternity and you are completely forgiven all your sins and you have eternal life as His gift And you're just as sure of heaven as if you've been there 10,000 years already. So Isaiah reminds us, he says, look, I've summoned you by name, you're mine. Now, he gets into the promises part and the, the presence of God part that we need to remind ourselves of when we're in uncomfortable um, emotional states. He says, look, when you pass through the waters, symbolic of overflowing circumstances, threatening circumstances, when you pass through the waters, I will be, what does it say? Here is God saying, when you are in that uncomfortable set of circumstances, maybe so uncomfortable you're wondering if it's just going to sweep you away. I bet you somebody right here in this room today, I'm not going to embarrass you, I bet you you, this week you've had some uncomfortable emotional states that you feared were just going to sweep you away, consume you. You just couldn't think of anything else. And the more you thought about it, the more your emotional state deteriorated and yet you just couldn't break the chain. Here is God saying, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You're never alone if you're God's child. He is with us, but you know and I know, unless we focus our minds and remind ourselves and say, oh God, I'm going to praise you in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this overwhelming set of circumstances, (laughs) because you are with me. You're not surprised by this. You're not caught off guard. I'm not alone. You are with me no matter what I go through, no matter how frightening it is, no matter how out of control I may feel. He says, I'm with you. He says, and when you pass through the rivers, now it's gotten worse. (laughs) They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, this is about as bad as it gets. Now, Now your existence is being threatened. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. You see, we have to stop at some point. And, and let's, let's just pause. Man. Let's get a mental break on this. So here we are. We're in our typical week. We're going through our circumstances, and all of a sudden we find ourselves being troubled by something and you know how your mind and imagination starts chaining things together and now the worry cycle is going and the fear and the the discouragement and the bad feelings and, and all this stuff here's God saying you've got to stop it and remind yourself of my presence with you you, so we literally have to stop and say God I, I know you're with me I'm going to praise you because you are with me you're 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 never surprised whatever I face what 
big deal when you are with me right in the midst of it. And I'm going to praise you for your faithfulness. And I'm going to praise you for your presence. And I'm going to praise you that, that you are not surprised by whatever it is that I'm encountering right now. You see, that, that, that's how this works. That's how this becomes effective in our lives. It goes on to say in Isaiah 41.10, it says, So do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. I'm your God. Now he starts adding some promises to his presence. He says, I will, what's the first term, first promise? I'll strengthen you. We start feeling weak. We start feeling beaten. We start feeling overwhelmed. God says, don't worry about that. I promise I'll strengthen you. And then he goes on and says, I will help you. I will uphold you. We feel like we're we're not going to make it. He says, you're going to make it. I'm going to uphold you with my righteous right hand. How long can we count on this? Even to your Old age and gray hairs, I am he who will sustain you. This gray hairs thing is becoming more and more personal with me. (laughs) I mean, I got got the stuff at home, man. All my band members just about, man, they all die. You know, they they, they die. I got my stuff, man. It's starting to get gray. (laughs) But he says, even to our gray hairs, he'll sustain us. He'll be with us. He'll uphold us. He says, I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you. And then the last one, he says, I'll rescue you. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have quite a history of God rescuing me inwardly and outwardly too. I mean, I've seen God in tangible ways rescue me. His patience, his, his, his understanding, his tenderness, his grace, it, it's unbelievable. But what God wants us to do is when we're in the rivers, when we're in the waters, when we're in the fire, he wants us to stop And he's given us the capacity. Listen, you may not believe it at times, but you can, and I can, I can take my mind and focus it on something else. That's what this praise is about. I stop looking at part of the picture. When we are focused, when we are riveted on our circumstances, on our problems, on on our lacks, on our losses, we're, we're seeing reality, sure enough, but we're only seeing part of reality. You see, praise brings into focus the unseen realities. And part of the unseen reality is God's right there with us. And he's going to strengthen us. And he's going to sustain us. And he's going to carry us if need be. And that's also real and true. But until we praise God, God, I praise you. You're going to sustain me in this. You're going to rescue me. You're going to carry me. You're going to help me. You're going to strengthen me until we praise him in this fashion. The realities remain unseen and unfelt. You see what I'm I'm saying here now? You see, even though it's true that God's present, even though it's true that he gives these promises to, to us, they will not impact us emotionally. We will not feel them. We will not experience what God wants us to experience unless we take our attention and we focus on God in the midst of it. Not that he's going to necessarily change it. Not that he's necessarily going to make it come out the way we want. But right in the midst of it, we can praise him because he is who he is. And his presence is promised. And his promises are faithful and trustworthy and true. But unless we take our minds and focus them on God and his promises, we will continue to lack that peace inside that Jesus spoken about and the trouble that is around us that we cannot control in this life. It will start to erode our inner uh, quality of life. And, and so praising God, it's first of all sanity. He's good. He's worthy. It's just seeing what actually is. It's not looking at part of the picture, but the whole picture And that starts to change the way we feel about things. Psalm 119, verse 148, the psalmist said, My eyes stay open through the watches of the night. Why? Why are you staying up, psalmist? Why? That I may meditate on your promises. We have to stop in the midst of the emotional discomfort and say, I am taking my mind off the problems, off of the irritating, aggravating feelings. I'm going to meditate on God's promises. Let me think. How do I do this? God, you say... You'll strengthen me. You'll praise you, God. You'll strengthen me. You say you'll carry me. God, I I, I just can't wait to see how you're going to carry me. You say you'll rescue me. Praise you for that. You're my rescuer. I I wonder what you're going to do for me this time. That's what we're talking about here. That's how it becomes dynamic in altering our mood, in altering an interior condition and replacing a troubled interior state with a peaceful interior state. God wants his people 
to walk through this life victoriously. It doesn't mean we're not going to have problems, but it does mean we can have his peace in the midst of them. Romans 8, sometimes it means looking at God's promises down for the future because he's going to make the right, all the wrongs right in time. He says in Romans 8, 18, the apostle Paul says, I consider that the present, what is the word? Sufferings. I consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. As it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has, uh, has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those. This is future for those that love him. 1 Peter 1, 4, it says, hey, you have an inheritance. It's there, it's waiting. It can never fade, uh, perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven in this other dimension, a real dimension for you. You see, sometimes praise means we go to God in the midst of our uncomfortable circumstances and interior condition, and we say, God... I may not be getting what I want. I may not be getting what I feel like I need. I may not be getting a fair shake. I may not be having the kind of circumstances that I'd like to have now. But you know what? You've promised me that in eternity, it's going to be forever wonderful, forever grateful. I have an inheritance. Praise you, my God, that you've given me an inheritance. Nothing can take it on this earth unless we live in the light of these promises. We will not have the peace that Christ intends us to have. That's walking by faith, by the way, not by sight. 1 Peter 5, 10, it says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, in the Messiah, after you have, what does it say? Suffered a little while. Should God's people ever be surprised that we suffer? What is the word? No, we should not be surprised. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and will make you strong and firm and steadfast amen whoever that was yes <laughs> so here's here's how praise becomes dynamic but you got to get this we don't praise god for the outcome that we would like to see no 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 we praise him in the middle of the mess that is indefinite and uncertain because it's sane it's because it's, it's just the right thing to do. I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this, and I really couldn't come up with anything very good, but, but let me share what I shared in the first service anyway. Suppose, suppose that your father was a CEO of a huge corporation, Fortune 500 corporation, and your father took you aside and said, look, I promise you that you will take over the whole corporation, but what I want you to do is agree with me on a, on a specific training regimen. What I want you to do is I want you to go and get a job with the company. I'm not going to help you. I want you to change your name. Don't let anybody know who you are that we're connected. And I just want you to work, and I want you to learn, and I want you to feel what it's like to work for the company. And I just want you to keep at it for an indefinite period of time. When I finally think you're ready to take over the company, I will give it to you. Now, I promise you I'm going to give you the company. The company is absolutely yours in the future. But for now, go out there and take your licks and learn and grow. And so sure enough, you, you join the company and you get a job. And, and right away, you're, you're experiencing things that are very unpleasant. People are talking about your father terribly. All he cares about is money. He's selfish. He's greedy. He's trying to grind every little bit out of us. He's a horrible human being. He sits up there in his clouded, you know, office and lifestyle, and we're down here grunging away. And you know that's not true. You know your father's not like that. But yet you hear it. And then the, the person you're working for takes a dislike to you, and, and they make it their, their mark to just make life hard on you, always give you the lousy jobs, never appreciate what you're doing. But you endure, you persevere, because you're reminding yourself someday... Someday I'm taking over, and you can continue on. Well, you get promoted. You take a different position in the company. And now, for whatever reason, this particular boss, this particular manager that you're under, just loves to attack you and humiliate you and belittle you and just make your life hell. And you go home day after day with your head throbbing. You're miserable. You feel sick. You're so upset. And you're wondering, man, I, I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know how much longer I can do this. And yet, each time you're ready to quit, you're ready to throw in the towel, you think, but wait a minute, you know, my dad promised me. So you go in there one more day. And then this person just starts humiliating you in front of the other employees and says, you're, you're, you're an idiot. You're stupid. You think you're going somewhere. You're never going to go anywhere. But here, you might as well get used to this, never knowing who you are, never knowing what the repercussions could be. And they're just humiliating you. And you're counting the days and you're counting the months. And then you're counting the years. And you're wondering, how long? How long? And, and, and you feel like emotionally, I, I don't know if I can do this. 
but you will do it. Because no matter how they belittle your father and speak horribly and charge him with odious things, and no matter how much they humiliate you and deride you and denigrate you, you'll remind yourself, my dad is a good man, he's righteous, he's fair, he's not like what these people say, and someday I will take over the company, (laughs) and I'll remember you that I work for, (laughs) and I'll remember you, right? Listen, folks, that is exactly the picture the scripture paints. That our God owns the universe. His kingdom will come. His will will be done. We are his sons and his daughters, his royalty. We will rule and reign with Christ. It's all going to be turned over. All the justice that's due, his people will come. We'll be rewarded for our faithfulness. And those that have tried to crush the name of God and crush the people of God, they will have a day of justice coming, but unless we remind ourselves of this, unless we praise God in the midst of the difficulty, we won't have the power to endure, uh, to go on through the hardships. So what praise does is a few things, and I I jotted myself some notes, bear bear with me. Praise is kind of like the telescope of the soul and the microscope of the soul. Praise allows us to see realities that we don't typically see with our natural eyes, but they're real nevertheless. It's no different than when you and I look up at the sky at night. Look up in the sky, and you can see, I don't know, maybe 1,200 stars. That's what Kepler, I think it was, said, about 1,200. How many of you know there's more stars than 1,200? Okay. And and just to to put a little teeth into this, uh, in our Milky Way galaxy, supposedly, and uh, nobody's ever counted this, but, you know, with technology and so forth that we have now, uh, there's supposedly 100 billion, 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Those are realities, whether we acknowledge them or not. But when we acknowledge them, we can say, oh, God, what kind of a being are you? Praise you. You created every one of those stars in our galaxy alone, 100 billion But it doesn't stop there. Or actually, it's 200 billion in in our galaxy, our Milky Way. But then in the whole universe, they estimate there's 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion with 200 billion strong. I mean, the numbers just get crazy. And, And when we stop and say, God, you spoke it into existence. You're the greatest designer. You're the greatest creator. You're the greatest scientist. These scientists we have, they they have a little bit of information and they get cocky and arrogant and paint you out of your own universe. But you put the stars in the sky. Praise makes us cognizant. It gives us the sense of God's vastness and his greatness and he's for us. Praise is also the microscope of the soul. When you look into a microscope, You see other realities. They're always there, but unless you have the microscope, you don't see them. Praise enables us to see things. They become the focal point of our minds. They become realities to us. They impact us emotionally when we focus on them. Let's look at the inner world, and this really gets weird. Uh, On November the 2nd, 2009, the National Geographic came out with this statement. Each cell in the human body, each cell contains 100 times as many atoms as there are stars in the Milky Way. This just gets bizarre. Let me, let me just try to help you. Each cell in your body contains 200 trillion atoms. Our God did this. He is that detailed. He is that awesome. He's that amazing. And no matter what's going on in my life, if I focus, I can praise him for this vast genius and artistry. He's the ultimate artist. He's the creator of music. He's always that. He's always good. And so when we, when we praise God, we become conscious microscopically and telescopically of his greatness, of his goodness, and that starts to change the way we feel about the circumstances that we're in. So we need to refocus on God's presence and promises, but I'm going to tell you something. If you ever try this, and you know it's true, you know, so you're all consumed with something going on in your mind, you had some unpleasant circumstances, and you're worried, and your emotions are all out of control, and you say, okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to praise God. So you start, you start trying to praise God, it will break down pretty quickly, and those troubles will come right back into your head, And then the emotions, the negative emotions will follow back. So, we have to learn to praise God kind of comprehensively. We need to linger. We need to go deeper. We need to get microscopic. We need to probe. We need to stay there and stay focused. And if need be, take pen and pencil and and write it out, whatever. And we're going to talk about that next week, about writing it out. But we need to reflect on God's goodness and grace. We, We need to go microscopic. We need to go deeper. 
The psalmist said in Psalm 145, he says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. He's worthy of praise. Just like a great musician or a great athlete is worthy, God is worthy. He, he's the ultimate artist. It says he's worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and he's loving toward all he has made. One generation will commend his works or your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor and your majesty. And I, the psalmist saying, and I will meditate on your what? Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask you to ask yourself, have you ever meditated on God's wonderful works? You know, I kind of give you a little sample. This man, all the stars, the planets, the, the cellular structure, the, the trees, the plants, the insects, the wild. Have you ever meditated on it? You see, that, that's what praising God. Oh, God, I praise you for all the, all the variety of animals and all the colors and the way you constructed my eye. And it, it's when we focus on his vast greatness and we get detailed that it starts to break the power of the negative mood with the whole picture. It's not being an escapist. It's not living in denial. It's simply instead of looking at part of the picture, it's looking at the whole picture because God is a part of the picture. Have we ever taken time to meditate on his righteousness? Oh God, you're so brilliant the way you you allow angels and humans free will. You, You let us show what we really are. You try to woo us to yourself, to your goodness, but you don't overwhelm us. You give us evidence, but it's compelling, but it's not overwhelming. You you love us to yourself, but you don't demand, you don't command. You'll even let us go astray if need be. I mean, you just meditate, you just stay there. I praise you, God, for the way you do what you do. You see, when we do this, we are praising out. Um, the power of the negativity that may be real in our life. It's not saying that we don't still have to deal with the issue. Absolutely, we have to deal with it. But we deal with it with an inner state that is healthier and balanced and seeing the whole picture. Our perspective is now accurate, whereas before it becomes distorted, it's as though the problem exists, but God doesn't. And praise puts God where he belongs, in the center of our circumstance. It says this in Ephesians 1, 7. It says, in him, meaning Christ, We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the the riches of God's grace. God's grace is rich, it's vast, it's deep. For it is by grace you have been, past tense, saved through faith. When we put faith in Christ, we're saved from the penalty of sin. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in this kindness to us in Messiah Jesus. Unless we remind ourselves of God's grace, think of all the stuff he's forgiven you for. Think of all the stuff he's forgiven me for. Think of all the stuff he forgives each and every day. Think of all the benefits and blessings he piles on us daily that we just kind of take for granted. But if we start unpacking them, we get a heightened sense of the truth of reality. And it changes these dark states in, into states that are much more balanced and appropriate for reality. Let me, let me share some more things that I said. I jotted down some notes myself about praise. I told you it's the telescope and the microscope of the soul. It's also the bank account of the soul. You and I will not have the sense of what a great position we're in in life, of how rich we are, unless we focus on God's goodness and God's grace and His promises. It, it gives us the sense of our good position. Praise is also the the gymnasium of the soul. You see, the more we actually praise God when we feel like it and when we don't, the more we actually do it, it cultivates, it develops, it expands our spiritual faculties so that the presence of God and the goodness of God is more prominent in us all the time. Some of us go around with a pretty strong sense of God's goodness and grace all the time because we have cultivated certain spiritual faculties by praising Him. The more you praise, it's a gymnasium of your soul. The stronger your spiritual senses get, and therefore your emotions, instead of doing this, they're, they're, you know, they stay balanced because you, you have the whole picture. Your perspective is clear, and that affects your emotions. Praise brings the truth about life into focus. Praise restores accurate perspective. Praise deepens our appreciation and our affection for God. Praise enriches the soul. Praise strengthens and cheers the soul. And praise is absolutely the path to joy. The more we search into God, 
and praise him for who he is. It delights us. Listen, when you stand up and you cheer for your favorite team, does that feel good or does that feel bad? Right? I mean, don't you feel good? Your team scores a touchdown. Or you feel like, oh, <laughs> I mean, or, or you're, you're, you're excited. It feels good to praise your team, right? When we praise God and we give him the worth that he actually has, he's the best person in the universe. There's nobody like him. There's nobody so kind, so powerful, so humble, so caring, so gentle, so understanding. Nobody's like him. Bear with me. I said this in the first service, and, and, and I do think it needs to be said. And I'm saying this for your benefit. I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. But, you know, we even showed in a clip last week how some people, you know, they, I want you to vent your, your feelings with God. I want you to be intimate and honest with him and all like that. But, you know, people get angry at God. We showed a little clip of a guy getting angry with God. And I hear this frequently. And I've got to be honest with you. I don't want you to be scared to talk to me and be honest. But, but you need to know, when, when I hear people saying they're angry at God, it, it's, it's like it wounds me. It, I, don't, I don't know how to explain what I feel. I don't feel angry at you, but I, I do feel hurt because you don't understand. You don't know him for who he is. You don't understand his goodness. You still have some sort of confusion thinking that he is supposed to intervene now in this lifetime and right all your and my wrongs. And he's never promised to do that. And, and when I hear people angry at God, I'm thinking... The one that loves you the most, the only one that can actually help you, the only one that, that really loves you unconditionally, you're angry at him. You, you don't get it. You don't get it. He's the lover of your soul. You should never, ever have a reason. There is no reason, folks. If we see the truth about life and about God, there's never any reason to be angry at him. He has proven on the cross that he is worthy of our trust, our love. And it, honest to goodness, it just it, it confuses me and hurts me. And, and then I feel bad for you when I hear you're angry at God because I'm thinking the one that is the anchor of your soul you're angry at. You think he's promised some things in this life that he's promised in the life to come. And that's the only reason we ever get angry because Jesus said, in this world you will have, what's the word? Trouble. Trouble. But be of good cheer. I've overcome this world. So... We focus, we reflect on God's goodness and grace. We, we take it deeper, we probe it, we meditate on it. And Paul found something out about God's grace that, that when he was at his worst moments, when he was at his weakest points, that, that he could experience the power and the sustaining grace of God more efficiently. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, but he said to me, meaning Christ said to Paul, because Paul wanted to be healed of something, and the Lord said, no, I'm not going to heal you of it. Can you hear that? The man wanted to be healed, and God said, No. I'm not going to heal you of that. Does God promise to heal us of every sickness in this age? No. If he did, nobody would die. Best I can tell, everybody's been dying for a long time on the planet. Righteous and unrighteous. But he does heal a lot of our diseases. And every time we get sick, we should cry out to him for healing. And he'll continue to heal us until he's ready to take us home. And when you don't get healed, it's time to go home. It's it's just that simple and clear. But Paul said... I want to be healed. And the Lord said, no, I'm not going to heal you this. Why, 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 Lord? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in what? What is the word? Weakness. When you and I are in a weakened interior state, when we're troubled, when we're confused, when we're scared, when we're lonely, when we're hurting, when we feel just hopeless, that's the perfect condition to just draw in God in all of his grace into our life and learn to live on a power source beyond ourself. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. you you got to go through it to understand it. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, says Paul, about my weaknesses so that Christ or so that the Messiah's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in heart. How many of you delight to be insulted? I don't. (laughs) See, Paul knew something better than me. Because he knew that when he was insulted and humiliated, that God kind of rushed in, in a way, experientially, to strengthen and cheer him inside and use him even more widely. He says, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships. Hardships, that's troubles. In persecutions, in difficulties. Why, Paul? What are you, crazy? You're masochist? For when I am weak, then I am strong. And then most important verse it's a, it's a little simple verse just hidden away in philippians we kind of pass over quickly and we go oh isn't that cute and poetic but it's it's loaded with power if you put it into practice 
Paul says, finally, brothers, whatever, and he doesn't mean it like whatever. He's like, <laughs> he's like whatever. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever, <laughs> whatever is right. My focus went out there for a minute. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what do we do with these? What, what does it say? Think about these things. Would God command us to do something that we're incapable of doing? No. That means that I actually can in any circumstance, if I choose to exercise my will in dependence on God, I can choose to think about these things. You may have noticed everything on that list was positive. You read that verse and oh, isn't it sweet and poetic? It has no power. But when you actually do this, so now you're in, you're in, the, you're in the fire, you're in the waters, you're in the rivers, you're, you're in the unpleasant circumstance, and you say, you know what, God, I'm going to praise you for all the things I know too. What is true? Let me see. My name is Randy. I was born in Washington. There's some people that like me and some people that don't like me. I praise you for that, God. I praise you. You've been we, we say, what's true? What's noble? We focus on it. We think about it. What's right? What's pure? What's admirable? What's lovely? We start thinking about the beautiful scenery and the grass and the trees and the mountains and the birds and... You focus on this, and it breaks the cycle of the interior negative condition. It's power in praise, not as an escape mechanism, not as something for denial, but it's seeing the whole picture. It is seeing the truth about life and focusing on those things that God says we should. Let me close with a... uh, a story by uh, a lady who I only know is Tiffany, and it's not nobody in this church. We do have Tiffany in this church, but it's not her. Uh, this is another Christian lady, and um, I'll just read what she says. She says, I don't know about you, but I have to learn the same lesson over and over before it sticks. And even then, it only sticks for a season. I'm a slow learner. Start praising him And keep praising him. Praise him no matter what. These words echo in my mind. Words of wisdom from my spiritual mentor and a dear friend. It doesn't matter what my circumstances or emotions are. She always directs me to God. To the healing power of praise. When life is the darkest and I feel hopeless. She reminds me to enter into his sanctuary. And present an offering of praise. And then Tiffany says this. So where are you my friend, at today? Are you on the mountaintop experiencing his blessing and presence? Well, then praise him. Or are you living out yet another midnight of sorrow and pain? Well, then praise him. No matter what, praise him. And that is exactly what God calls us to do. Not because he needs it, because we need it. And it absolutely is one of the most powerful things to break a dark mood that you can imagine. Casting Crowns, a group that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with and like, they have a great song called, I Will Praise Him in the Storm. And part of the words, the chorus, and it goes like it says, I will praise you in this storm. I will lift my hands, for you are who you are. No matter where I am, every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. That's exactly what God calls us to do because whatever the circumstance is God is always who he is his presence is yours and mine his promises are faithful and trustworthy if we start to practice praise we'll start to laugh at a lot of the things that used to take us under and keep us under for far too long let's go ahead and pray Father we want to thank you that in a world full of grim realities because of sin our sin sin of others uh, sometimes it's hard not to be pessimistic but we thank you that there is beauty eternal beauty it's in you it's from you it's for you and we thank you that you invite us to realize it to live in its light to keep it focused by praising you for who you are and for what you've done Help us to cultivate this practice of praise. Not not for it to just be something we tuck away and forget about, but something that we live forevermore in the light of. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.